themes uh, tend to go together. However, uh, they do, uh, some themes tend to go together better than others, let's say that. Um, I'm not going to show all my work tonight. Uh, in fact, I'm sure that's not why I was invited here, to show all the work. In fact, uh, significant parts of the work have been left out, although it sounds like I've got a lot I, I don't. Um, I'm going to show you a specific uh, kind of work, and you might take it as a, a kind of an elitist uh, uh, area of, of the architect's uh, activity. Uh, I think it's not, and uh, I'm prepared to do battle on that. Um, if, if I show you buildings which are generally, um, as, as my students have said recently, the only thing I get these days are tack on uh, buildings in the back of other buildings um, that are primarily for upper middle class clients. Um, that's not to say that that's not part of the architect's responsibility. Um, it isn't what I would prefer doing. However, uh, one takes what one can get. Um, and um, you may, though, um, ask me how they turn out the way they turn out. So I'm not showing you uh, uh, multifamily housing or low-income housing that I've done in places like Trenton and Jersey City and, and Newark. And if you've been in those places, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry for you. Um, uh, Indiana is a marvelous place. You, you have no idea. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm going to talk also about a difficult subject, uh, and at least in, at this time in modern architecture, and then I'm not going to discuss functionalism. And uh, I was on a panel recently in Texas, and they, uh, they well, well, it was an interview really, and it was, a, it was a charming kind of thing that, that we went through, uh, where I was asked to describe my work. I, I'm into doing that. Uh, for about half an hour, and then the, the other architects that were on the panel were asked to respond. And after I had presented some sort of uh, position about my work, uh, the first architect was asked whether he agreed or disagreed and so on. And he said that, uh, in fact, he disagreed that, that he had felt that modern architecture, at least as understood in this country, at least understood in this country since uh, the turn of the century, had to do with a functionalist ethic uh, after Lloyd Sullivan. I felt that pretty short-sighted. However, um, I knew what he was talking about and was anxious to respond to that. And let me describe it this way, that um, the architect felt, the architect who responded quite genuinely to me, uh, felt that um, architecture tended to make itself upon a description of the function, whatever that function is, like this room being a lecture hall, that lecture halls are a particular shape and uh, carry a particular kind of, let's say, aesthetic with them. Um, given that you've all seen the rest of this building, and the rest of this building looks essentially like this lecture hall, uh, except uh, a little shorter and squatter, uh, the rest of the, of the room, and that's not to put it down yet. Um, uh, it, um, it looks essentially the same. You know, the detailing is the same, the materials are the same, and so on, the floor. Essentially, the same kind of room. That's not necessarily bad or good, except that it has very little to do with function. Um, that this room looks like the drafting rooms I saw upstairs and in the basement this afternoon. Um, so what are those other problems about architecture? It's just the way it looks. And where I become um, difficult is, is that I would say that how it looks is also a function. And most semiologists would say that how it looks is also a function. In fact, most disciplines would say how a thing reads or is understood is certainly one of the central parts of functionalism. So I, in my response to the Corpus Christi architect, I said something to the order that 
um, for me, function has at least three facets. One, the, the uh, function that he was talking about, which was the, let's call it for shorthand, the measurable kind. The kind that will tell us about uh, certain requirements that any building has, and any building uh, necessarily has to have. Um, the, the kind of thing that we can measure from here to there, the fewer steps, the uh, amount of energy, the uh, various parts of the building that relate uh, one way or another to another part of the building in uh, a certain sequence. Well, I would submit that that kind of function uh, is no more nor less than other kinds of functions, which I will uh, allude to. And yet it is taken as the, in a sense, the whole game that modern American architects work with. Um, the, the, the function of the way a thing looks uh, is also um, a part of how it operates or that measurable stuff. I also think that the measurable part of the building is, or the architect or the designer is interested uh, from a certain gaming standpoint from that, that um, let's call it pragmatic aspect of functionalism. But the, the uh, semantic part of function, the way I think is read or understood, is certainly as critical to our judgment of a piece of architectural building, city, whatever, as uh, that pragmatic one. And certainly if we have a semantic, if we have the meaning, we have a syntactic function. Um, semantic relative to uh, the way the thing operates uh, or is is, uh, is seen in the pragmatic sense. Now, that's, in terms of definition, that's all I'll do tonight. Um, there won't be any more jargon, um, and I don't think that's very difficult. Um, it it is though essential that the architect understand meaning, understand what he is about in terms of the way we look at and therefore understand uh, what we do. Uh, in the introduction to the book um, Five Architects, Colin Rowe alluded to um, a, a quote by uh, Aldo Van Eyck, which said, uh, what you should try to accomplish is build meaning. So get close to the meaning and build. Uh, a bit glib, however, it is a part of what you're going to see tonight. Um, I'm going to, to uh, show you a series of pictures. There'll be slides on both sides, or two tandem slides that we'll go through, and there'll be comparisons. And I'll also ask you to compare uh, the various themes. And for you, as I said earlier, to form the synthesis of those, those uh, various judgments and uh, thematic responses that you have to this. Okay. Let's start with the first two slides. Oh, I have a point. Uh, could you go back one? Terrific. OK. Uh, now, you probably think that you're at the wrong lecture. Um, However, we'll get to the point in a minute. This is a kind of preamble uh, to the architecture that will come uh, in, in, in just a second. But I want to talk about a problem and so I, of, of aesthetics, so I go out in sort of left field for the architect and, and, and take the most ephemeral part of what we do, the way a thing looks. And, and this will be threatening to some and upsetting to others. But for a moment, um, uh, play with this. Now, on the left, there's the Adam and Eve of the Bamberg Cathedral. Uh, and if you look at the faces of Adam and the, and the face of Adam and the face of Eve, you will see um, essentially the same face and essentially the same figure. There are, however, uh, symbolic breasts on Eve. And that's about the only thing that we are asked to accept as differences, or as the difference between Adam and Eve here. And 
The sculptor in the 13th century was essentially saying, I'm identifying primarily with the male figure, I am male, and, and secondly, uh, if I am to, to render a female, this is the symbolic gesture that I will take you through as the observer, and that's where we respond and the differences. On the right, uh, we see Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus, or a fragment of it, and if you look carefully, I don't know whether my pointer will do this or not, well, experiment. If you look carefully in the upper left-hand shoulder, being the only left-hand shoulder there, uh, right here, you'll see a kind of shadow here. That's a, that's a piece of the painting that has been painted out and remade. In other words, it's a kind of trial and error. And if you look closely at the way the, the upper arm is, is joined to the breast and to the shoulder and so on, you see a kind of tentative nature to all of that. But those of you who know Botticelli don't look at that sort of thing. He was still getting used to the kind of anatomical references that were necessary to depict uh, this particular scene of, uh, or the theme the idea of the picture. He was still de dealing with the technique. Uh, look at the face uh, and so on, how lovely that is next to a more primitive gesture of the Bamberg, uh, Adam, or Eve. However, look again at the way the head and the neck join and look at that primitive uh, juxtaposition. It isn't quite right yet. And one doesn't usually see that because you're taken by the kind of marvelous expression in the hair and so on. Let's go to the next and some of this will come clear. All right, now look at two more um, Botticelli's. These slides will be a little better if we could get the, 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 the bottoms lined up. I hate to be sort of architectural about that, but uh, there are some curious connections that will be made. Okay, now here's the whole uh, Birth of Venus, and there's that same shoulder and so on. But what I'm showing you <laughs> these slides for is that I want you to see something that, that both the, the Bamberg um, Adam and Eve and the uh, Botticelli's have in common. And that is a kind of simple idea of composition. The idea that the central figure in this, this one, Primavera, and on the right, the, the, the uh, uh, Venus, are both centralized to the, uh, the picture plane, and the, the, the uh, various figures around that form the rest of the picture are, in fact, uh, disposed symmetrically around that picture. It is easy for us as observers uh, to make the connection to the theme of the picture, to get the message of the picture. It's that Aldebanite kind of thing. Because the, the central idea is to prepare us to learn to look at these pictures uh, and to see that, in fact, uh, the, the message is involved in the theme, birth of Venus on one, the coming of spring on the other. Next, please. <clears throat> now, finally, this is the end of this little uh, uh, preface to this little talk. But on the left, we have uh, Raphael's Galatea, and on the right, we have Titian's uh, Rape of Europa. The difference here is now seen in, look at the technical expertise that, that uh, uh, Raphael has in starting to show us the figures in the round. We're starting to see uh, the figures as contorted. We start to see uh, uh, a, a more liberalized gesture toward the whole figure. Uh, but if you compare that uh, puto to this one, you see that uh, only 20 years later, the, the idea was turning around, was to make it more difficult. What was being made more difficult was not just the technical aspect of mastering the, the anatomical references and, and so on, but in fact, um, Titian has left the idea that, that uh, uh, Botticelli, uh, 80 years ahead, and uh, uh, Raphael, just one generation behind him, had composed their pictures around this central idea, this kind of easy idea of centrality and, and uh, symmetry. What has happened here in the interim with Titian is that he has asked us to start to look at the problem of space. And for architecture, it's obviously essential. And if we were to go to a place like uh, 
the Regency Hyatt in, in uh, Houston, we would see a space that uh, tends to be almost endless. Uh, is more space better? No, I'm not saying that at all. And I want that rather clear. What I'm saying is that spaces are made primarily by the objects around them. And this room and your drafting rooms and so on are made and we understand them as an idea by the various artifacts that we place uh, around the room that in fact uh, structure the idea. And if we look at the space that is made by the figure, the figure, the figure, uh, that tripartite arrangement, the puti up here, um, Europa's friend rushing to her aid, and Europa and the bull over here, we start to make a correspondence between those and involve the space in between by virtue of uh, what we understand as the surround of the picture, in other words, the kind of girdling of the picture of the, the objects themselves. Look at the, uh, as a parenthetical kind of thing, look at the kind of confidence that, that Titian now feels uh, relative to the central figure's face. Uh, remember the Primavera and, and uh, the Venus, now look at uh, Galatea here, but then look at Europa here with uh, a shadow across the face, we we're allowed to get into the picture, as it were, even, even into the subject matter, and uh, identify with it. And in that way, it seems to me that uh, architects can start to think about the way aesthetic propositions, or this thing that, that I'll call the meaning, in, in, or the uh, semantic level of function, uh, starts to involve the observer, you may know around here as users, uh, in the, the, the whole subject uh, uh, matter of, of any picture, be it a, a picture of architecture, an activity of architecture, or a painting such as this. Okay, now let's go quickly to the next. <clears throat> uh, the title of this lecture is called A Little of the Old In and Out, um, and it's from uh, uh, Clockwork Orange. And it talks essentially about a psychological problem of meaning, a uh, meaning that we give problems of in the interior and the exterior. I looked at uh, one project this afternoon of a thesis student, and we talked about problems of the landscape. How does an architect start any problem? What does he set up? Uh, what, what is there beyond the, the, the programmatic concerns? What does he bring to the problem? How does he start to decompose and compose space? How does he start to compose his space relative to the land he finds himself on? All right, I'm going to set this little theme up by a series of uh, what are diametrically opposed uh, spatial propositions. On the left, uh, Frederick Kiesler's 1925 version of City in Space, and on the right, uh, Santa Consolazione in Todi, uh, a Greek cross plan church, the uh, very early Renaissance, uh, and the differences I think ought to be apparent. However, let me say that, that at the church in Todi, there is an idea of centrality, an idea of focus, an idea of looking to the center, to the Baldacchino, to the dome and heavenward and so on, and the liturgy, in other words, the uh, liturgical program support all of that. Uh, it's almost as if, you see a kind of uh, terribly small and honorific door here, uh, it's almost as if those doors don't exist. Once one is in that building, the idea is uh, ever, uh, the, the center over and over again, always pointing to the center. And uh, in, uh, the exedratic forms on the, on the uh, sides of the building, these kind of absolute pieces uh, as well, start to support uh, the whole form of the dome. I won't be as elaborate with the rest of these. Uh, on the left, Kiesler's idea, on the other hand, is to take, in a sense, a different kind of chunk of space. Uh, it's to say that, that um, there is also a political polemic here as well, but let's, let's keep it to a kind of formal analysis. There are indeed, within Kiesler's assumption, um, moments of centrality, as in the church at Todi. Uh, there is a moment in here where uh, we start to form a space very much like, uh, or not so much like, but on the same order as, uh, as this room, uh, where it, there is a moment of centrality. But what happens, in fact, is that the perspective and the forced perspective of that kind of construction starts to suggest that 
uh, there is an equity of space that, that one would spread out as in a kind of uh, de style gesture. Next. <clears throat> All right, uh, now there'll be several slides simply to support this notion of, of centrality on the right with uh, here at Palladio's Villa Rotunda and on the left, uh, 1942 project for a concert hall uh, by Mies van der Rohe. And one would expect now that, that Mies would, would start to uh, describe space with a kind of planar juxtaposition where Kiesler did it in, in a kind of linear fashion. But given a larger space, Mies would tend to continue and make continuous the landscape under this kind of um, uh, formal analysis, while Palladio would uh, essentially uh, end the composition uh, at that one point, the, the, the critical point of the periphery of the building, at, at, at the, now what has become four doors around the edge of the building, one taken as, as uh, a, a central and, and frontal. However, once inside that, we are asked to forget that idea. Next. <clears throat> and three cross plan church, which starts now to uh, decompose ever so slightly and become a point to the world similar to the four uh, exedras at uh, Santa Consolazione. We now have eight. We have chapels in the corners, and we start to make a kind of uh, wheel out of the whole thing and we start to striate the space and move the space both in and out because of the frequency. Again, the Baldacchino in the center and the centrality of the church is still not in doubt. Uh, on the left, we now start to specify uh, in uh, uh, El Elisitsky's uh, prone drawing uh, several spaces, um, very much like uh, a combination of the Kiesler and uh, the uh, Mies constructions. However, there's a, a, a basic difference, and that is that, that this little black square here and the large orange uh, uh, parallelogram there and the small red one here are taken as a kind of stopping point, a momentary rest within a larger spatial construct. We'll get to more of this in a minute. Let's go on. Next, please. Okay, and Moholy's uh, photographic collage on the left starts to allow us to identify now in that spatial conception uh, with either the dancer or the child or even the dancer in perspective. In other words, a depth proposition is brought into the collage and we can identify with one of three positions or is it five with this kind of black uh, parallelogram again or this, this kind of transparent cube down here. Uh, Panini does the same kind of thing uh, as he calls our attention to the ambiguity of the centrally planned organization in that no site, but no site, uh, is uh, idealized to the point where we can ever forget the problem of the sun and the uh, problem of entry, if nothing else. But Panini starts to show us the, the, the kind of, in Eliade's terms, the, the sacred light here uh, at the oculus, but he then distorts the space and shows us uh, what, in the 16th century, um, a uh, a reflection of that light on the wall, and he starts to say, what are the differences? Just in that kind of conversation of light in the, in the painting uh, uh, of the Pantheon, he starts to say, all right, look at the ambient light around the edge, and look how once the light has been gathered around that point, uh, we start to call our attention to the differences in the kind of ambient or profane light, as again, Eliade would say, or the sacred and central light. Uh, and the, the, the basic assumption of the centrally organized scheme is, is being uh, decomposed or compromised in this way. Next. All right. Uh, let's finish that theme and start with this one, which uh, is, in, is a kind of uh, uh, easy one to slide into. However, it's absolutely critical uh, in terms of, of your performance as an architect and starting to describe space and how one goes about making those early marks uh, on uh, the landscape. On the left is a, a drawing of uh, Le Corbusier's uh, uh, Maison Domino uh, scheme here, which you, I'm sure, are familiar with, and the thing that he was countering in his polemic on the left. 
Uh, the house on the left is seen as a kind of me medieval uh, idea of construction where it's a bearing wall uh, condition and we must have the walls uh, which are then punctured by windows very much like uh, the low house, the Frederick Low House in Bristol, Rhode Island uh, on the right, uh, built by Stanford White. Um, the similarity between the American model here and here is exactly what Korb was talking about uh, in his political polemic of that idea. In the Low House, uh, Korb was essentially critical of that kind of proposition in that uh, it was a singular idea. Now, it's not the kind of uh, position that uh, the Greek Cross Plan Church of Todi takes, uh, given that there is a, a frontalized uh, uh, proposition now, this front and then the beach front on the other side, um, start to give it a kind of linear idea, but it does come directly to the ground. The ground is therefore usurped by the building, and uh, the building, uh, in its form alone, starts to be an object in space and needs about it, around it, uh, surrounding that, that object, needs the idea of a full uh, and horizontal plane, as we know uh, the kind of American ethic of the side yard, and so on. Now, what Korb was essentially saying, and this is not the subject of, of the talk, but I, I want to set this up, and that is that the ground plane in the Maison Domino being supported, uh, the building being supported by uh, reinforced concrete now, uh, needs only point supports, and therefore he can lift it up. Uh, that ground, like an American Indian uh, proposition, is free for all men, and that ground plane has been transposed to the upper reaches of the building, uh, known as the roof garden. In a sense, he's saying that what this roof garden shares with the rest of the landscape is full and open sun and, and the breeze and so on, and one is free to make a new landscape up there. However, we know that, uh, that there is still the existence of a problem on the ground floor of what does that become and is that really a free space within the free plan. Let's go on and I'll be more clear about that later. Next. <clears throat> okay. Now, what I'd like to show you is from those two uh, uh, diametrically opposed positions, uh, the idea of the, the Stanford White Low House or even the, the uh, church at um, uh, Todi, and uh, the Maison Domino idea of free and open planning uh, on the landscape. Let's see where um, a kind of historical uh, romp might take us, uh, which, uh, I'm sorry, will be a bit superficial because of the time, but let me show you a kind of, uh, a, or a series of ideas that some Renaissance uh, landscape uh, architects and uh, painters uh, were starting to describe. What was used at a place like the Villa Reale outside uh, Turin was uh, in, in a garden which, which was to surround the object, very much again like the low house as an object uh, condition, was a garden that was on a larger model, a mo model already known and understood by uh, that architect, the model of the basilica. If you look closely, what you're going to find is the side aisle, uh, the nave, uh, again the altar, Baldacchino, and then around the backside we get a kind of exedra, which is in fact a theater, which I'll show you. But it is the form that started to enclose the outside, very much the way uh, the architect, or we know, insides are enclosed. And Perugino does essentially the same thing. And I'll point to this as a, as a key slide in, in this little talk, and that is that there are there's a kind of Renaissance space set up here, which you should be conscious of in looking at these things, in that there is a foreground, the foreground made of the apostles, Christ giving the keys to St. Peter, form a kind of facade of the painting. And behind that, there's a middle ground where these uh, minor figures and smaller figures occur, and then a background, uh, which is in fact very much on the model of the Villa Reale and the other uh, buildings that we've seen now, the centrally planned buildings, where the the central idea is again of the dome, the centrally planned church, and uh, this time uh, the side aisles uh, are, are described by uh, the, the uh, cross arms of the basilica here and here seen as gates. Um, what, what Perugino has done is set up a kind of Botticellian space for us 
uh, here, which is easy to assemble, and we can get directly with the meaning of the picture, which is simply Christ giving the keys to St. Peter. But the, the important point is that all of this is understandable on this kind of tripartite space, foreground, middle ground, background. It's, it's in a kind of a, a, a very simpleized, simple proposition. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, more of, of, of this kind of theme where uh, at Villalante we get again the facade of uh, the altar and again the exedra in the back and, and the side aisles describing the kind of garden plan which is actually the villa of the villa here and uh, the Villa Reale's uh, theater seen this time starts to describe in microcosm now uh, an interior proposition outside starts to enclose the outside and in Venturi's uh, words it is both and it is both indoors and outdoors in other words what's being thought of uh, as a kind of psychological uh, proposition is that once outdoors one is trying to make um, a kind of inclusive gesture and once indoors one is trying probably to uh, explode or, or uh, decompose and open the, the, the environment up. Next. Okay, now I'll, let me com compare some interior and exterior uh, pictures. Um, uh, at uh, Tivoli on the left, uh, we get a, a building uh, called uh, uh, Four Seasons and in fact starts to describe within a garden room uh, through all the details of the room, the lattice, uh, the birds in the lattice work, and, the, and garlands and flowers and so on, wild beasts and so on, spilling out of a kind of uh, altar. Here we get the whole idea is brought about in the detail idea of outside. It is a, it's a room that is supposed to free us from the confines of the interior, while uh, at Aldo Brandini uh, on the right, the reverse is true. Again, in a kind of theater, uh, the architect has, in fact, started to close it in and ask the trees, in a sense, and started to bring them in as context and starting to make the kind of vaulting of, of the soffit plane, which incorporates the sky and so on, and uses all exterior, or pardon me, interior motifs, the kind of motif that we know on the interior, not the kind that we least expect on the interior here. Uh, in, a, in what uh, 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 somebody in semantics would call uh, a literary reversal. Next. Okay, now a more mundane kind of theme, that is that we ultimately deal with material and what does the material have to do with the idea of the concept. Uh, on the right is an anonymous gazebo outside London uh, where again we get that centrally planned uh, notion uh, now decomposed by the material alone. Uh, think of the marvelous light that must exist within that uh, gazebo as, as there is as much unbuilt as built. In other words, it's, it's composition that is built up uh, in idea like uh, an enormous block of stone cut out, but it is, it is in fact built by uh, lattice and, and an ephemeral kind of material that through the material uh, allows the composition to decompose. On the left, two things going on in Tatlin's Tower uh, of the 20s, uh, a Russian constructivist idea of what space was about, again made by lattice, but now it's doing two things. It's not only centrally uh, oriented the way uh, the gazebo is about this kind of spiral, but we now start to see how it spirals in and spirals out of uh, that centrally uh, organized uh, uh, a position uh, uh, simultaneously. We're getting uh, the stability of centrality and we're getting the dynamic of that movement, very much like uh, San Pivo uh, in Rome by Bonamini. Next, please. Okay, now, uh, the, the garden uh, outside the American Academy in Rome, which starts to be the reverse of the decoration inside, a curious kind of juxtaposition where uh, the, the cabinet here is obviously an object in space, an object on the wall, uh, the reverse of the object void here. But uh, our idea of darkness outside, uh, again, all the decorations seen uh, as an outdoor figure, an outdoor meaning, uh, but we are asked to see the cabinet in two lights, a kind of both and again, 
where the cabinet is both deep because it is dark and it is also figure because it is simply a cabinet in the end. Uh, within the frame of space, which is also out, a, an idea or a metaphor for outside, uh, uh, the reverse here where the trees have been brought together and, and kind of tied together to give us kind of aisle of space uh, to compose a, a room or an aisle in the exterior. Uh, again, ambiguous propositions, interior and exterior. Next. Uh, at the Schoenbrunn Gardens on the left in uh, Vienna, uh, we start to get the, that aisle of space uh, now simply uh, composed about uh, the, the trees, a kind of leaf thick into uh, the uh, uh, chapels beyond. Obviously, they're not. The architect is simply giving us references that we are indeed comfortable with in an enormous garden and finding ways that, that we know uh, and start to compose, uh, he starts to compose the space around that. Uh, very much like uh, the Fountain of the Flirt at Tivoli also, where again, uh, the trees are starting to form uh, the, the, uh, the base of the vault and the sky is asked to be the soffit and so on. And, and the uh, composition of the various elements forming the wall of space are all borrowed, as it were, from uh, the inside. Next contradictory terms. Now, I'd like to show you uh, some ideas about how meaning is derived without the liturgy of the Basilican form, without the um, uh, liturgy of the centrally oriented church, uh, and uh, take, for instance, uh, almost any annunciation uh, for Angelico on the left uh, starts to describe the problem of two panels uh, a two-panel painting, as you, as you probably know, most, most diptychs, uh, uh, as, as, uh, as an enunciation, were set up on two pieces, one and two, uh, the two arches here, so that the division would be secure, that we would know that the archangel comes uh, from the outside and uh, the virgin is inside. As you see, they both exist on the porch, but the significance of where they come from, uh, the outside, uh, in other words, heaven, uh, the inside, in other words, dwelling, uh, is, is thought of as a way of setting us up and making complex the idea of the symbolic content of the picture when we are asked to compose around that division, and without the division we wouldn't have had the possibility of this composition of the message itself bringing the painting together left to right, right to left, and so there's a kind of grid of the formal division of the, of the picture by the column and the symbolic uh, division and combination across the, uh, or the gathering together of the two sides by the message itself. Uh, Brancusi, in his uh, 1908 version of a, uh, hewing out a, a kind of dumb block of stone called the kiss, uh, uh, makes that uh, momentary uh, idea twofold in, the, in this way. If you look at uh, the theme of the uh, sculpture as the kiss, you can see uh, that depiction very clearly. But if you look at it frontally, now like the Perugino that I showed you, you start to see a kind of cross-eyed uh, version of a single uh, figure, centrally uh, cut as this is, uh, and hair parted in the center and one mouth and one kind of uh, sweater on here or whatever. But you get two figures, or actually three, the kiss, uh, a to B, and then a single figure. In other words, it's a kind of cubic proposition of turning the stone for us uh, back and forth, left and right, and this problem of division, the kind of wall that the architect makes, however he makes it, whether it's here or here or, or here, or that kind of wall, is now being uh, decomposed by the, the, the mere dynamic of the message. Next. <clears throat> All right, more of the same. Uh, here is uh, Roselli's Annunciation. Again, just a reinforcement of the one you saw before. Interior, exterior, column division, and the message going across. In fact, Roselli draws a kind of uh, halo of light coming through the column, so we really don't miss the point of the combination left to right. Uh, and now, um, the, the other major Brancusi is what's called the endless column a kind of serration of space uh, up through voided space. And what Brancusi is saying here, I think, is 
is calling our attention to the problem of uh, the void of space and saying something about the grid that we find space in, how we start to divide and start to give meaning to <coughs> pardon me, left and right and so on. His endless column starts to say something about the, the void of space and starting to bring that into the composition. Next, please. Almost as if we had pinking shears to kind of cut up the space. Um, using the idea of a diptych on the left, uh, a cover that I did for progressive architecture, which showed the, the differences and the similarities between Peter Eisman's work on the right, which was seen as kind of uh, syntax of architecture, and my work on the left, which is a kind of single take of uh, the semantic of architecture, neither of them being very true, uh, was a way of describing two problems which contributed to a single center. Uh, and on the right, uh, and a kind of uh, remodeling that we did in Princeton known as the, the, the Gunwin office, which I'll refer to more as, as this goes on, uh, was, it is a remodeling and there was this kind of problem of uh, the, the existing structure of the building and the embarrassment of a column existing in, in the kind of the center uh, of a room. How does one go about making the wall around that column? How does one go about making uh, the room be more than um, it was before by the, the, the existence of that, that previous column. And in this way, one starts to set up problems and make known in the space problems of left and right, uh, uh, one orientation and the other, problems of light and darkness and so on, by uh, having the column there and then getting to construct a composition uh, uh, in a sense like a cubist table around it turned up so that left and right are known only by the problem of the column being brought into the composition, being a part of the context, not being exclusive uh, of the context, but being inclusive and brought into the kind of localized context of the mural painted on the wall of a conference room behind. Next, please. <clears throat> okay. Now, the idea of space and meaning in space becomes more difficult with painters such as uh, Matisse on the left and Cezanne on the right. If you look at the Cezanne, uh, I'll spend a little time on this because I want this to be seen clearly. Uh, Cezanne knows full well that he can go into the landscape and paint a rather clear description of the landscape, so he does not, in fact, set that as his only problem. What he does talk about is how we look at space and what are the ambiguities and what are, are uh, the distinctions in space and how do we perceive those. And so the, the painting is kind of discussion of that, and he sets that up as uh, his landscape uh, dialogue with us. And what he's drawing our attention to in a picture like this is very much like the diptychs that we saw a moment ago, where on the left and on the right, we have a division made by a kind of Brancusian column, the tree. But it's more complex than that column, uh, which was a kind of diagram of a piece of sculpture. Look at it this way. If you see the base of the tree here, and the tree emanating at that point and going up to the full height of the picture, it's easy to divide left and right. But he gives us something else. In the reflection of that tree, he in a sense brings uh, the trunk of the tree and lets down and lets us imagine for a moment that the tree is emanating from two places, both here, since we are kind of gravity prone people, we tend to draw it up through the space, and so we get another, like the Brancusi kiss, we get, we're getting two trees now, the reflection of the tree and the real tree. But that isn't really what he's done here. He's given us that kind of um, um, perogino-like space when he gives us the three parts, the foreground being the reflection, the middle ground being the real tree. But now look at this kind of uh, anonymous, anonymous little guy here sitting in the corner. He allows that branch to combine with the branch of that tree and become uh, a kind of continuous branch or an anonymous kind of construct in space. And he, in a sense, warps this tree back to that one. What does that mean to the architect and why go through that kind of elaborate description of that tripartite arrangement, foreground, middle ground, background? I think the reason is, and the lesson that I get from it at least, is a problem that we all have in a kind of difficult 
uh, idea of the procession through any piece of architecture or any landscape or space. And that is that what we perceive as a kind of facade, like the painting here, and what we see as the progression through that when we've forgotten uh, what we've passed and we're on to number two and then on to number three, let's call those uh, the kind of simultaneous understanding of space, seeing the whole thing. And um, then after that, the, uh, the, the space that comes about from, from that procession, one, two, three, as one proceeds from, from the outside to the inside. Uh, and we get that kind of collapse of an idea, both uh, that simultaneity and that progressive idea of space uh, seen in the same picture. What that does for the architect is allow him to use then, uh, it seems to me, um, the idea of those two notions, uh, in a sense, superimposed on each other uh, to rely on our remembrance as we go through the space and also rely on uh, the symbolic content of each of the elements as they relate one, two, three. Obviously, in any uh, elaborate description of architectural space, there is more than a tripartite arrangement. So the thing becomes more difficult. Uh, on the left, uh, that same kind of collapse of space is seen in the symbolic content of the picture itself. In Matisse's blue room, uh, we see uh, a kind of blue window and a blue interior and what we are asked to accept as a kind of blue, light blue table here. If you look again, uh, you see a kind of double hung uh, organization of window here, this whole thing as a window and this as a mullion, with these pieces being as seen as muttons. Uh, and you get two things now. You get kind of deep space with the table, and then you get a kind of flattened space uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the conception taken as a window. Now, if you look at that, that kind of mutton coming out of the figure, this golden figure here, uh, we're set up for that as the kind of striation of left, left and right and so on around that opening, that window. But if you follow this mutton up, it becomes a kind of plume-like tree, and we can take it for two things. We can take it as uh, the tree outside, or we can take it as something, in a sense, growing out of this little green vase here. So again, he has collapsed the meaning and allowed it to stand for two things and talked in the picture to us about what references we have to go on in space and what we have up front to give us the clues of the symbolic content of any picture. Next, please. <clears throat> now, um, I think this is probably a more interesting picture uh, in that, uh, again, Matisse on both sides, in that he collapses the space and sets us up by uh, the same kind of window frame now. Here is this kind of pink uh, casement window frame, and uh, he sees it as a kind of coplanar idea with the kind of pink brick street outside at Nice. And so we kind of follow that line through the picture and striate the figure, in fact, right at her waist and so on. And in a sense, the, the depth of the picture is not in question. Uh, so he's talking about the kind of flatness that any painter or any architect has to come to deal, has to deal with on a facade or the series of facades as one start to de de starts to decompose space within the interior. Um, but look again at this figure who is standing at that kind of ambiguous place, the, the, the kind of cultural condition of both in and out of the window, standing at the window sill and the expression on the face and so on, uh, alludes to the fact that she is a kind of an ephemeral figure and not very stabilized in, in this whole thing. But he, he draws another figure for us, and that's the shadow of the figure. After he's composed her around this kind of ambiguous space, and made her that way uh, by doing so, he composes another figure, which is her shadow and the kind of drape behind becoming her gown. And the clue is the kind of decoration on the wall. This picture is called Woman Holding a Mandolin. Here's the mandolin, and here is the shadow of that mandolin, which is a, a kind of second figure. And he, he, in a sense, does two things with that shadow. And I find this rather intriguing about the problems of windows and the whole cultural realm of the opening or the membrane between inside and outside and what it, what it contains and how we go about making it. 
a simple little idea that not many of us know about. Uh, this, this figure, the, the shadow, is ever so much more uh, elusive, ephemeral, and decomposed, as it were, inside the room uh, as, as her, her, her shadow, but ever such, so much more uh, stabilized by the fact that she is controlled and behind and enclosed by the open window. So she's again both and, both elusive and stabilized in, in, that, in that position. Uh, Matisse asks us to see at one time distance and foreground by uh, this kind of combination of street and, and windowsill, uh, which does this kind of back and forth idea of space and left and right are composed around that window, again a diptych uh, between figure and shadow. Uh, just a reinforcement so that you don't think I'm making all of that up. There are a series of pictures by Matisse that would compose that kind of red brick street and bring uh, them inside or that, that collapse that space across the picture plane. He's doing the same kind of thing with the curtains here that he does with the figures over there. Next, please. <clears throat> now, taking a step further, this idea of uh, sequential and simultaneous space. Uh, Matisse uh, allows us uh, the full range of his aesthetic when he allows us to participate uh, rather directly. Identification with any picture is, for me, uh, a picture being a picture by Matisse or a building by you. Uh, identification with that through identifying with the objects or the, the meaning in the picture, the space, uh, is the kind of supreme art that, that, that we undertake when we try to construct any, any meaning about uh, uh, the, the, the buildings we make. Now look at the left. Uh, there's, a, there's a simple mirror that Matisse draws himself in here, Matisse being in his deathbed at this point, making a sketch of the model. This is the real model. This is the shadow or the, or the reflection of the model in the mirror. So Matisse gives us himself in the mirror and the reflection of the of the model in the mirror and the real model. What that does in kind of art historical jargon is allow us to combine with the picture by saying Matisse, model, model, Matisse. In other words, A, B, B, A, and we become that other A. We're the observer. We're the ones that combine with that a kind of oblique reference, uh, upper left to lower right, and join in the picture. We, we tend subliminally to, to start to make the composition uh, very much like the Botticelli uh, composition, we start to reconstruct that, that uh, uh, symmetry of the picture. <coughs> Essentially what I tried to do in uh, breaking down a wall, uh, why does one want to do that? Uh, break down a wall between what was essentially a very inclusive uh, interior and a roof garden beyond in that same office that I showed you the mural in a, in a moment ago. Uh, there was a wall that separated of, of the existing bearing wall of the building, very much like uh, the core parody of, of uh, a, a bearing wall building on, that we saw on the left. Um, but I was trying to engage the, the people in the center of a three-part arrangement. Here's the president over on the right, uh, secretaries in the middle, two more partners here, and then a roof terrace where the president got uh, the street, he, he was paying the bill, uh, the partners got the roof terrace, that was next best. Uh, the secretaries took a bag in the center. How, in fact, can I get them to function with both left, left and right, in terms of taking dissertation and all the kind of things that they go through, and also identify them with the outside? We'll talk about how they identify with the street facade but in a moment, but on, the, on, on this slide I want you to see, take note of that uh, simple green stair, which uh, gives access to a library up above, which is painted, uh, the soffit of which is painted something like the sky. The stair is painted something like a poplar tree. Next. <coughs> now, the wall here, seen in, a, in another mural, composes the, the wall here, tree here, tree here, and it starts to make reference uh, from vertical access to space and vertical access to space, uh, soffit to soffit, outdoors to indoors, and draw the similarity of problems of looking up, problems of looking across, and problems of calling into question uh, 
uh, the, the, the peace that stands in the way, as it were, and in, in a way, in one's uh, uh, mind, decomposing that. It obviously doesn't decompose on its own. What, it, what it's, it, it, it's brought out is that the things around it are causing a kind of friction on that wall, uh, or the, the attention to that wall is being brought about not by, by changing and hollowing out the wall, which we couldn't do, but, but uh, composing around it. Here's that same stair on the other axis now bringing the, the context of the local context of the interior this light side of uh, a kind of exedra of the stair the kind of finish of that axis as one gets up on the balcony as being uh, cast into light now by the skylight that you can just barely make out this kind of fleshy skylight behind uh, seen as a kind of consequent uh, axis drawn across here where the stair and the tree outside are composed around the other way uh, on the other axis. In other words, one is decomposing on one side the soft over ceiling. You also see that, that uh, the kind of pinkish tone of the white ceiling is gained by the reflection of the, of the, of the pink sky. It also kind of decomposition without really painting it that color. So in a sense, we're breaking out of the volume given by, by the, the idea of polychrome in this sense. Next. Um, okay, uh, Jan van Eyck uh, did essentially the same thing uh, that I tried to do in that stair and Matisse tried to do in that simple line sketch. Uh, here again, uh, uh, Ardolfini and his wife here, uh, left, right problem composed around the hands being clasped, the, the composition is clear. Uh, but look at that rather significant mirror back here. Uh, in that mirror, we see the back of Arnolfini, we see the back of his wife, and we see, in fact, ourselves, or we identify with the observer, uh, the, the, the justice of the peace, as it were, in this case, uh, standing in the space and combining with the picture, being the other party, uh, being a party to the space without having, in a sense, his portrait painting, but being ever so much more significant in our mind as it starts to stride the space uh, in the frontal direction as, as uh, these two figures dry at this pace left and right. It's a combination of a kind of formal attitude towards space and a kind of cerebral attitude towards space. Again, both and. Next. <clears throat> okay, um, one of my favorite paintings, uh, again by Matisse on the left, is a, a simple little picture um, that you can find at the Museum of Modern Art in New York called The Piano Lesson. Um, beyond its, its marvelous texture and color and composition and so on, what is the point? Uh, what is Matisse getting at uh, in a picture like this? Matisse, um, probably the most misunderstood painter in the 20th century, is not simply decorative. He is an extremely intelligent painter in that uh, look at the similarity of this and those open windows at Nice for a moment. Here we get the, the same kind of idea of the street being brought in when we get the balustrade uh, of the balcony here and the music stand being now co-planar and setting this kind of axis of the picture across here and drawing our attention to this problem of perspective, not being able to measure perspective, not being able to measure depth. So he brings it all up front and at the same time he pushes it back. And how does he do that? He makes a kind of gesture. Everything he uses in the picture, he gives some symbolic uh, value to. The little metronome, which stands uh, uh, here, which we completely understand uh, in the picture and, and supports the idea of the piano lesson, combined obliquely with this kind of metronome of space, this kind of wedge shape of grass, which stands for perspective, I would imagine, uh, outside the balcony. Uh, and we get upper left to lower right. And that might be far-fetched if we didn't know that the kind of mother standing in the back here, uh, a large female figure here, combines with the only other female figure in the composition, upper right uh, to lower left. So we've striated the picture now uh, obliquely across this axis and across this, this axis. The key to that, after he set us up, as it were, with this kind of uh, left-right uh, striation and the vertical one of the diptych, the two-panel thing to set up this conversation, left and right, uh, is that 
he's used the bigger of the wedges uh, in the background and the smaller in the foreground. The bigger of the two figure, uh, figures in the background and the smaller in the foreground. Um, and in a sense, he's brought them forward. He's made ambiguous this problem of perspective and, and pulled it up front for us. He does that until we start to think, what is all of this stuff about, all this kind of frame that he starts to compose the, the figure of the son and the figure of the mother about. And we are given the momentary idea that perhaps that's not the mother at all, that that might be, in fact, a painting of the mother and flattened out on a wall at that point. And so the whole thing is set into this kind of motion of our participation in those little puzzles, those clues about problems of space. Um, I tried uh, in my uh, Alexander renovation, and the buildings that you'll see of mine, there are only, I think, two, two whole buildings, and those are seen in another kind of uh, larger scale context, but most of the things that I've done are tack-ons uh, and, and the little pieces behind houses and so on, so I'm not very dangerous uh, and, and don't make much of an impact. So you've got little buildings like this or little rooms like this given a great deal of uh, effort and attention. Um, I'm sorry for that little apology, but anyway, this is an existing house in Princeton, and we couldn't really put a window, like Matisse's window, uh, uh, physically into the building, so there was an idea that the, the client would look at his very precious rose garden outside the window. Uh, the plan of the room and a kind of plan of his wife were drawn up on the, the facade of, of the room, and a common combination of this window and a window adjacent to it, which has a kind of green shutter on it, draw into a kind of local context uh, the whole problem and set up for uh, making an opening in a wall, be it illusory or being it, uh, or whether it is in fact uh, uh, reality. Next. <clears throat> Here's that uh, same little room. I'm sorry, this is uh, a little bit brighter green than you see here, but this is that shutter which combines uh, with that kind of grass or shutter of space, one up front and one in perspective. Uh, but the reason I show you these uh, two slides juxtaposed is to, uh, to draw your attention to uh, a consequent problem that the architect and the painter have, and that is this, this, the significance of, of, of form and light. Uh, Matisse draws a kind of ellipse of space here, as you see all the arms more or less joined. And then he collapses that space, very much like the painting before, by the ambiguities of, of the figures. He uses those figures as the architect here should use the column and the, and the wall and the spandrel and so on to start to describe the problems of a room like this. Um, they are our artifacts as architects. And here, Matisse allows us to see the ambiguity of space by uh, combining those two hands with the kind of knee of that figure back there. And certainly, they could have clasped hands like those, but they didn't. They were pulled apart. And in a sense, they're touching that knee, and the knee is brought forward, or the hands are pushed back. Same kind of thing that happens around this corner, same thing, kind of thing that happens with this figure, in a sense, standing on the, the, the uh, forearm, arm, uh, the upper arm of, of, of that figure. Well, uh, architects don't deal directly with that kind of collapse of space, but they do, do deal with kind of collapse of, of perception of space and the significance of uh, uh, spatial artifacts such as light. Remember the Pantheon. Uh, that I showed you in the kind of central light of the Pantheon as it, I don't pretend that this is the Pantheon, but it does have a light skylight that has to be thought of as different than the side lights. Uh, now I put that in the plural because I'm saying that that kind of Dutch Van Eyck-like light uh, right there uh, is on the side, and you remember that ambient light coming in the Pantheon, is is different than the kind of centralized light and the kind of setup that we think of that light and the way it pins space, look at the reflection on the floor or the, the light as it's driven through that axis uh, to the floor. And as the ambient light, the side stuff, combines with uh, the illusion on the wall of side light, it takes on uh, one kind of relationship. And as it 
as the illusion or the more or less sacred or central light combines with the illusory light here, which is also seen as ambient light, it takes on another relationship. There is an ideal or polemic about the, the tabula rasa of, 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 of that table landscape and what it ought to be and what it can be and what it in fact is. And he makes that conversation about light and the opening and the ambiguity of where you are relative to that opening and the perspective and all simply by composing around those two propositions of life. In uh, a doctor's office in Fort Wayne, um, a, a remodeling job I am not stuck uh, with quite so many walls, but wanting some of them uh, back again, uh, composing about uh, a kind of open plan the walls that once were, it's a kind of ruin of the space and a ruin of the perspective that was once there. Um, a degenerate idea, I know, but it's using the context, uh, a kind of beam that runs across left to right here and opening up within that beam a kind of attic story. And within that attic story, a window within the attic story and lighting the wall behind it around the mural. In other words, getting that kind of light that, uh, that Picasso finds uh, in his landscape here and his tablescape uh, about the proposition of the problem of space within uh, a very compressed interior. Next, please. <clears throat> All right, I mentioned uh, the, the, the problems of windows uh, and you'll think that I'm kind of uh, dwelling or hung up on the idea of uh, those simple little gestures that architects make like windows and doors and floors and ceilings and so on. I think that's probably just about all we do. Uh, or all we should do, and we've bitten off a lot more of that cake than we probably are able to do, and one of the things we don't do very well is uh, make uh, the enclosure that we are supposed to know about. Uh, that's in opposition to uh, kind of making policy, uh, which we don't control very effectively, or probably shouldn't. Um, uh, team man at heart and all of that. Um, now, on the left, uh, two kind of uh, cerebralized windows by Le Corbusier. It's Bestiegui apartment in the Champs Elysees on the left. Uh, Corb does a very, very effective uh, 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 job of bringing the, the kind of dumb context or outdoor context, kind of context that we wouldn't think about except the kind of turn of the day and night and day problems and rainy and, and sunshiny skies and so on. He brings it into the composition and in a sense borrows it. Now, what do I mean by that is that in a simple roof terrace, uh, not so simple as, uh, as you probably know when in its final elaboration, but at least in this slide, look what he's done with uh, a simple outdoor uh, fireplace and a tree and a little stair. Okay, he divides the space and he sets up left and right as we've seen before. That's not to say, I don't mean that you should all rush back to your boards and make a kind of uh, diptychs of your buildings. But he sets up uh, that at least because he's dealing with one house and two street. And he's seeing what the similarities and, and uh, differences are between those two, two uh, problems. And he does that by showing, in one sense, the similarity. Um, he, he composes this little black hole of space, uh, the, the fireplace, and the wall around it, and makes that a kind of small version of a larger one, the sky and the, the kind of fireplace, the, the uh, Arch of Triumph here. And uh, he makes a kind of perspective, remember the Matisse perspective now, where the larger thing was in the back. And he draws that space up close for us by using the wall of the sky, which he's now seeing as vertical because he set us up for it here, uh, and pulling that whole piece into this little piece here. He doesn't, I'm sure, expect you to walk out there and say, oh, look what he's done. Uh, he's made a kind of fireplace look like uh, uh, the Arch of Triumphs, and he's made the Champs-Élysées a part of my path up to uh, that, that uh, fireplace. He does, though, expect you to allow that composition to unfold at least behind the scenes in your mind, as he does at his mother's house, where he makes a very, very simple metal-clad building uh, in a sense, more important than it actually is by drawing in the context, by, in a sense, not throwing the building into the landscape um, and making the building look like landscape. What he's doing is describing the landscape about the building and vice versa. Uh, he 
He drilled a little hole for us here, very much the way he did there, a little lunch table uh, in a garden wall. Nothing could be simpler than that. And looking out at Lake Le Mans. But that, I'm sure, is a little setup for drawing the, the column and the opening in that wall to a larger window that he describes for us through tree and soffit and wall or sill and that same kind of magnifying glass that we saw in Picasso and that large version of the two, left and right, about uh, that space. And he doesn't exactly, he, I'm sure, doesn't expect us again to say, oh, look at the window that I've made for you. Uh, he expects us to start to compose the space uh, and see the, the mountains now, not just as kind of marvelous distance, but uh, again, like Cezanne, bring it up close and allow it into the context of the picture and depend on it for the construct of the architecture well, as well. He makes them uh, indispensable to each other. Next, please. Now think of that versus the, uh, the centrally planned organizations of, of the Palladian, uh, the Palladian uh, Villa Rotunda and the, and the uh, Church at Todi, which were singular conceptions, uh, in a sense, put on the landscape. Now, um, in my own work, uh, which we'll see now more of, uh, the, the idea of window, the idea of opening, and the idea of the invasion of windows and symbols that we take as the, uh, normally take for the exterior of the building, have been employed in these two instances in the following ways. On the right is a stairway uh, whose um, um, model is that of Chambord, and I'll show you the Chambord stair in a second, uh, which essentially is a stair that stands free of the building. And the purpose of this stair in the Snyderman House, in, also in Fort Wayne, uh, is to separate the stair from the house uh, in idea and combine it with the house in, in actual fact. Couldn't afford an exterior stair, had to be inside. It didn't make a lot of sense to have the stair on the outside. But the stair, in a way, was to be thought of as a separate entity because it also led to a guest suite upstairs. So the idea of somebody entering the kind of porch and vestibule of the house, uh, kind of old-fashioned notions, I know, but then getting into a stair which was a building unto itself, not really, obviously, but but again, composed about windows and, and, and openings and striations of space, which alluded to the idea of separation at the same time, uh, the consequent idea of combination, how that outside wall, for instance, in this case, this green wall, which is on the edge of the building, is brought up close by the series of events, the polychrome idea of a kind of natural reference across the space. This is one view of the stair, we'll see others. Um, this is the a, a, a same kind of window uh, of space in a mural that I painted in Milan uh, last year at uh, the Triennale, which composed, uh, in a sense, uh, on, on a flat uh, uh, section, what we see here in uh, deep space on, on the right. Next. All right, the Chambord stair uh, here, and the idea of the stair being a building within a building is similar to my Snyderman stair. Uh, here is one of the windows. Uh, one of the doors, for, or a pair of doors to the guest suite here as one comes out, enters the window space and turns and is on in the stair building as it is here. Uh, much more decomposed. Again, though, having a kind of centralized light now, uh, again like the Picasso light, as against the ambient light of the, of the normalized windows around the edge of the building and the kind of conversation between types of light supporting this idea of central stair uh, being both private to the guest suite and public to the, to the uh, family itself. Next. <clears throat> um, I mean, you can and probably are asking yourselves, uh, uh, a stair doesn't have to be that elaborate. A stair could be done anyway. Uh, yes, a stair can be done anyway. Uh, but I'm trying to talk about problems of, of the making of architecture in the making of the stair, in fact, in making the stair and the light and so on. And the, the stair that one is critical of, or, the, or any kind of artifact, whether it be stair, movement, procession, space, whatever, and the stuff that, that the artifacts that surround that space, um, uh, can't, in a sense, make itself. It doesn't predict what, what it is. We, we have to, in the end, make it. And 
I tend to make it a conversation about what, in fact, it is, um, which is indeed a leg legitimate uh, proposition and is, uh, in a, a sense, a, a Renaissance idea. Um, on the right is a, is a museum recently completed in New Jersey where uh, along a kind of passerelle, an upper level uh, bridge uh, in, in the building, there is an outdoor room or a room thrust into a, the symbolic uh, idea of outdoors. Uh, in other words, it's exterior to the building fabric by its polychrome. Uh, the way that the, the, the support below green and the uh, kind of Etruscan red above are painted starts to suggest an exterior conception within the building. Uh, again, like the Snyderman stair. This happens to be uh, the, the director's office and is not a part of, of, of the museum. It is, it's not a part of the, of the of museum that uh, one generally goes to. So through the position, through the polychromatic value, uh, and through the juxtaposition of at least those two things, one starts to set up the idea of externality to uh, the procession through uh, the, the museum at hand. Uh, very much the way uh, that Etruscan red starts to set up the idea of wall, uh, this is a mural in Fort Wayne, uh, wall of space from which we can register the deeper space uh, beyond uh, in, the, in the mural. Next. <coughs> Okay, uh, a few more uh, windows. You'll see uh, several pictures just taken from the other side since there are so few buildings. Uh, I, I try to get all I can from it. Um, now we're inside the guest suite uh, on this side in the Snyderman house uh, coming out to that stair uh, and uh, the window in the stair as very much the way I've used uh, a bay window on the left here, if you can see the, the pointer uh, now around the bay window. Well, you all know that bay windows simply don't happen inside buildings. Bay windows happen on the street. But if you turn it around, if you invert uh, the idea that one is culturally accustomed to, you start to suggest something else. And uh, again, legitimately, one can start to bring the idea of external light into the interior of a building by the artifact window. Uh, this is the room of the president's office of that Gunwin uh, building in Princeton that I showed before. The secretaries are here, and uh, along the major axis of the space, that, that uh, light blue soffit is up here, uh, the column supporting the soffit, the column supporting the soffit with a kind of uh, modillion of support here, painted like a branch and so on. Uh, and all of that is composing around an external idea bay window, which in a sense turns them into uh, external propositions of light or the light that's gained in that, in, in that interior. Next. It doesn't really do that. Obviously, it's an allusion to that. Uh, one hopes that, in, in a sense, that one is more comfortable with that kind of uh, psychological uh, uh, plus. Next, please. Next. <clears throat> All right, uh, slipping quietly into doors. Uh, here at uh, the, again, the doctor's office in Fort Wayne, a re uh, as I said, it was a remodeling. We found that door. Uh, it was the door into the, the main lobby and changing its context now and elaborating the door about the stuff that I think doors are made out of, porches and vestibules and so on. but in a very cramped uh, and small office, trying to get uh, as much of it uh, uh, to signify problems of entry and exit and calling attention just to getting in and out of the place, finding uh, the door to the building. And I must say, uh, I'm extremely critical of a building such as this, that the one we're in, uh, which in a sense has, ha is, is a freestanding object on the open landscape, and, and from the corner um, that you all take daily and so on, you sort of drive in diagonally into the door or if you've come from the parking lot, you just kind of wind your way around and look for uh, a side with a door on it. The building doesn't have to scream doorway, but there ought to be uh, some kind of reference on the, on the sides without resorting to uh, painting it on like super graphics of the response of the other sides of the building to start to suggest what is uh, that frontal condition of entry 
which is essential to our, our initial procession through any uh, architectural organization. Well, using a kind of window, an interior window again, and the shelf that collects the magazines, and around that the, the kind of uh, uh, place to keep one's coat and the light and so on, you make a kind of propylea of space and extend the emphasis of the door and make the wall, uh, again, this kind of wall color, uh, culturally accepted, I suppose, as wall, uh, and whether it's a, a brick or a Tuscan red or whatever, it is the thing that sets us up for an external condition. Uh, and the kind of problem of, of that division between what is external, uh, well, really external out here, I don't know whether you can see, the, I think my battery's fading, uh, the, the, the garden out here and a little tack on in Princeton, and a kind of ambiguous inside and outside the courtyard here, and then uh, the kitchen uh, beyond the, the wall between uh, those two positions, or the two walls between. Now let's try the space like Matisse did. One, take that lattice wall, and two, let's take this other facade out here as one, and the wall back here. You start to see the kind of uh, painted on, or just revealed idea of the slope of the existing house, of trying to incorporate idea of pitched roof in a place where it had to be a roof terrace out from uh, a future French door uh, upstairs and so on, but starting to collapse that space in idea uh, against the old house and making it a part of the context without simply making it uh, a kind of lineup of windows and a kind of cosmetic uh, orientation toward the proportioning of the old building, trying to get it in the mind as well. And the other division of space which is this kind of lattice piece, uh, which separates the, the, the kitchen here and the outside, uh, being both window, this blue job here, which is like that one, and the door adjacent to it, setting up internal and external conditions around the wall and then decomposing both material like that gazebo and, um, and uh, then throwing it all into shadow. I'm sorry you can't see it very well into this kind of oblique space. One of my students recently said that I was surely the Cubist kitchen king of the East. Next, please. Um, that's not a compliment. Uh, on the left is um, the uh, 1942 composition of Brock, um, which is that marvelous uh, piece of tavolo rasa, which opens the drawer quite literally by, by the knife, by cutting the space open here. He allows us access to the various planes of, of, of meaning of the, of the new landscape or tablescape here. Um, and in my Snyderman House construction picture of this house, large house in Fort Wayne, getting from roof terrace here, uh, and this is part of that guest suite that I talked about uh, with a house generally back in here, uh, getting from the roof terrace of, of the house to the roof terrace of the, of the, uh, the upper roof terrace of, of the guest suite, one is asked to go, in a sense, outside uh, the neoplatonic position of the frame, establishing that as wall and window and door and so on, but that is the position uh, established on the landscape from which one makes other judgments and starts to peel away as Brock has peeled away the levels of meaning uh, virtually by the dynamic of that knife, the stair itself being external to the Neoplatonic frame here, uh, and its dynamic related to uh, the more uh, Euclidean uh, and orthogonal references of, of the uh, house uh, itself. Next. <clears throat> and uh, the, the idea of frame here uh, as now, a step back from that stair that we saw before, as seen as part of the skin or flesh of the building, as we move from uh, one internal and yet external condition, metaphorically, to another, uh, the old wall of the building, and that kind of reversal here where sky and object landscape are reversing to, to show the ambiguity of frame and, and uh, field. Uh, on in, a, in another mural on the left. Next. All right, now I, I simply, uh, I, I will go more quickly now. I want to show you 
a series of slides which uh, incorporates some of these themes, the problems of internal and external ambiguity, the problem of setting up uh, something outdoors that we know and enclosing it, and also uh, the elaboration of uh, external conditions inside, such as that stair which exists in this house. This house will be uh, polychromed uh, in the future, and it'll be some time because it's, it's going uh, very, very slowly how one goes about this sort of thing. Uh, and so all architects are anxious to get their things finished and occupied and so on. This house has been occupied for a couple of years, but, but slowly but slowly we will, in a sense, color this house uh, in a way that that stair has been colored. So what you see here is a white building. We'll start to make a greater reference uh, to that problem of frame and where one moves a wall out from the frame and allows it to shield the south light uh, in the living room and the guest house, the guest house up here. Everywhere one moves back and forth from the frame, something is being said about uh, the, the form of the building itself and its activity uh, relative to uh, the Neoplatonic uh, square of the house itself. Next. <clears throat> okay. Uh, an, another kind of frame, of the, the metaphor of incorporation of the external idea of the landscape. This time the trees, in a sense, brought in by virtue of a simple green beam here uh, uh, as a kind of coplanar gesture and the kind of collapse of space, in other words, allowing those trees to form the facade. They obviously are pushed out in the garden, but uh, for the moment they form the kind of enclosive gesture of this problem of inside and outside and the psychological problems of night and day and so on uh, as uh, this kind of reversal of taking a natural form, a lyrical form, making it on the architecture and the, the trees, these trees now seen here in a different perspective on the side now seen as composed about uh, a comment on those trees. In other words, they are the infill of the spaces. They, in a sense, form the soffit or the wall of the space, and the trees are brought in as, as the wall of the roof terrace of my Benassar house in Princeton. Next. And now a series of slides which will, will juxtapose painting on, usually on the left and, and the building on the right, uh, showing how the form and uh, the meaning try to get together uh, in problems of decomposition and composition, building up and letting loose, and opening and closing. The frame in my Keeley house in Princeton is established quite clearly, again in a kind of uh, Euclidean form, and then all the uh, eccentricities of the building, the support, uh, this kind of pylon of support calling attention to a door over here, the stair, a circular stair there, uh, a kind of everyday uh, 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 sunscreen up on, uh, canvas sunscreen up here, and another canvas sunscreen in the front of the building, not drawn in this, in, in drawn out in this case, but rolled up. All of that forming, as you see over on the painting on the left, a kind of oblique or uh, Tatlin-like uh, surround of space around the, the more ordered and uh, externally uh, 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 constructed uh, open uh, space of, of the building itself. So you're getting, a, again, a kind of enclosive gesture by the eccentricities of, of the activity and the uh, open uh, gesture by, by uh, the decomposition of, of the frame itself. That house and, and other sides of it. Um, here's that uh, little, uh, you can't really see it, uh, right here, the, the uh, awning that comes down and is a part of that enclosive gesture. Next, please. <clears throat> and now, uh, how even shadows start to on buildings and give uh, the architect the opportunity to combine the oblique of the shadow as, again as turning inward or enclosing. Uh, obviously the shadow drives a kind of hole in a, in, in a wall, but it also by its oblique reference starts to uh, be dynamic around the point, uh, very much the way the stair here and the perspective here in my Alexander house and uh, an illusory or metaphorical window drawn out on the real house is back here, and, and uh, the master bedroom window has been opened up 
and brought out on the frame to, to sponsor the view to uh, the garden before. <clears throat> this is a job that uh, came about five years after I had done that internal mural in, the, in, the, in a little room up in the upper story. And this is a play on, on the context that I had made earlier. Next. Okay, now you're seeing both the metaphor of the tree, uh, in a sense, finishing in the Benazir house that kind of lyrical line that started across the facade and the tree being on the axis of that kind of little squared out uh, opening at the top, uh, in, in a sense, justifying nature uh, or justifying architecture, if you will, back and forth, and that play is made. And here's that green beam seen from the other side, uh, standing at the, the hedgerow uh, and the other side of that green beam. And, and, and uh, the, the lyrical opening, where the house now and its shingles and so on are asked, I think not very successfully, uh, but asked to combine with the open frame and become the kind of soffit of space. So uh, that uh, a rather difficult juxtaposition is made uh, slightly more palatable if one is, is willing to combine the open frame with, with the, the wall of the house and bring one to the other next. <clears throat> if I had that to do over again, I would think I would make it slightly more literal. Next. And if many more articles were written on it, I would make it much more literal. Um, now, uh, again, the Snyderman house and that uh, idea of frame and the idea of, of window and uh, entry here at the, well, I don't know whether you can see it. I'll bring it down here. Uh, entry here underneath the guest house which is there and into the stair and so on inside and, and up to uh, those terraces uh, that that uh, guest house scene over here <clears throat> next please and now uh, two corners of that building where uh, uh, the light uh, at the wall is decomposing this kind of garden wall which is actually an interior wall of the house and bringing actual daylight into the, the, the periphery of the building. And one is asked to see a similar kind of light as the uh, sunscreen of the guest house composes around, uh, lyrically around uh, the, the frame of the house itself. And, and one sees a kind of trade-off between uh, real nature and uh, uh, illusion of nature back and forth. Next. Trying again to make kind of both and uh, uh, possibility of reading uh, when inside and when outside. Uh, now again the tree and alley window and then uh, the open window of the soffit of sky used at the Snyderman House in Fort Wayne where the sky now is brought down literally on the uh, on the on the roof of the of the building and composes around the architecture itself very much the way the painting does. Next. Um, and the way one uses uh, one's own context uh, for light uh, and uh, frame and so on. That little uh, magnifying glass we saw of Picasso's is now incorporated uh, as a gesture to something remembered and brought in as a reference also to my skylight in the same building here, which is casting its light down on, on the mural and lighting, in a sense, uh, the, giving the ocular light to the mural while the, the ambient light is coming in from the outside, as well as uh, the metaphorical glass block window here, which is now dropped out of that bay window up, up above uh, and brought down into uh, another secretary's uh, kind of enclave down here, yet another window uh, out of one's own context. Next. <clears throat> uh, and now, uh, in, the, in the Hanselman house in Fort Wayne, I want to show you how I've made a kind of swap, or attempted to uh, make a kind of swap for, uh, and used up uh, in a spatial configuration, and this is a more formal idea of uh, spatial trade-off than the, the metaphor, that, or the metaphors that we've been talking about, I've been talking about, and that is that uh, on the right you see the isometric of the house, and there is in the house, the house itself is composed about uh, two private sides of the house, here and here, other buildings existing. The good light, however, the good view, the stream and so on, are down in this corner, and this is southeast, 
and the building generally looks out along this oblique, uh, the oblique of that terrace there. However, the only access to the site is along this route here, frontalized uh, against the house. So there's a kind of built-in conflict of the diagonal of the house and the frontal access to the building. What I've done, or what I've attempted to do, is, in a sense, take away, or the, the space that's been taken away, now look over here to the left, the house as built without uh, the weaving studio outside on, the, on this kind of passerelle. Uh, the, the, the weaving studio, not here, but uh, nevertheless, the void of the house around that corner um, is now traded off. And what I've tried to do, at least in, in composing this isometric, is to say, all right, what is built here is not built in this kind of double square. Uh, the square made by the facade, this kind of uh, uh, propylaea of facade in a double square organization. Now, I hope this is clear. Uh, that that void now becomes solid outside. So you get a kind of double L of space. The L of solid in here with void in the lower left-hand corner and the L of solid out, a void out here with the solid in the lower right. And there is this kind of play back and forth and when the, the, the weaving studio is built, whether that is actually the case or not, what is, trying, what is being tried here is the identification of void outside by sponsoring the, or building up the edges of it and, and taking from the, the, the volume its own context, its own stuff, as it were, and putting it outside, drawing it through the composition and putting it outside. Next, please. <clears throat> making by doing that a kind of intermediate space between what is really wild outside uh, and what is really controlled inside. There should be a slide on the left. Uh, if you can get it to drop down. No? Uh, well, you missed one. Okay, That's these, these two are pairs anyway. Um, the, um, the, the same building, the Hanselman House, as, as one moves through it now, the procession through those spaces and through the wall that, that is the membrane between those two and the kind of windows that are set up in murals and so on that call your attention to this problem of simply moving from inside and outside and what are the artifacts that start to control uh, that understanding of entry. Next, please. Okay, simply more of the same of that, uh, that kind of frame, this time uh, uh, back in Princeton in the Gunman office uh, uh, the, that kind of propylaea getting into the, one of the offices and one of the murals in Fort Wayne. Uh, again, in a, in a very small uh, examination room, trying to break down the wall, as it were, pushing the space beyond and allowing one to identify with distant space. At the same time, trying to incorporate in that simple chair rail and other pieces along that datum in the picture a kind of uh, internal context and drawing the painting and the room itself into a kind of a whole cubist uh, space and allowing one to, in a sense, drift into uh, and out of the, the, the trauma of the impending examination and so on. Next, please. Um, the kind of uh, more ephemeral aspects of the collapse of space as one looks at uh, metaphors of life real light, reflected light, uh, metaphors of beams, uh, real beams, and so on, as they collapse against each other and both extend and collapse sequential and simultaneous understandings of space. Again, the Three and Alley mural on the right, where the only context was an existing door uh, on the right. So there are, a, in a sense, a series of doors uh, of meaning in the painting itself. Next. <coughs> Uh, again, using one's own context uh, in terms of reflection at the Alexander House uh, and uh, the reflection of glass block uh, on the glass wall and, in a sense, getting two, two semi-opaque, semi-translucent uh, walls, in a sense, for the price of one. Next. <coughs> More of the same of, of, of what perspective uh, starts to contribute to uh, the idea of looking through the frame, drawing the, the garden into the construct, the, al the allowance of, of uh, darkened interior to construct the, the uh, reflection and, and extend that space laterally this way. 
uh, and to allow us to be several actors uh, in the same play. Next. Um, and more of that problem of externality, uh, again, that museum where the light, the polychromatic value, and so on of uh, the director's office up here are starting to be seen similarly as the perspective perspective of uh, a mural that I, I painted in uh, uh, Texas last year uh, starts to open up problems of external forces as they're brought into internal uh, understanding. Next. And finally, uh, the kind of uh, tripping up that I do in my own work of, of really myself in, in looking at interior windows and artifacts and light and so on, metaphors of external space in the inside and seeing the reverse outside where uh, a simple window cast in a roof terrace here uh, uses, the, again, the sky uh, and the artifacts of uh, outside uh, to set up interior conditions to allow us, again, uh, to be both uh, uh, engaged in the landscape, engaged in the protective notice, notion of the interior uh, with some degree of simultaneity. Thank you very much.
They, they look very much alike. <laughs> That's my problem. Um, the question is, will this kind of, I suppose Joe's saying, will this kind of work um, uh, lend itself to obsolescence as one makes the kind of change? Um, I would, uh, what I would like to do is see that, that the fragments that, that one is composing and not seeing, in a sense, whole pieces, but there's a kind of strategy at work here um, that would see uh, not simply the, the construction of one proposition and the casting out of another uh, at all, but uh, the recomposition as a strategy changing and having influence through the whole series of gambits or, or gaming that might go on in, in a building like that, I think is, is in fact the opposite of obsolescence. Um, I think that a Warhol statement about current culture is intended, in fact, to be obsolete, and that's where it gains its value. For instance, if one makes a gesture about a, a Brillo box, uh, he's obviously saying something about today's um, culture relative to that kind of activity, to that kind of form, to the way we think about it, making it high art, and, and drawing in a kind of context of every day to high art. It's a marvelous kind of gesture, but it's momentary. And it's not seen as, the, the whole idea is, is, simp is, is surely extensive. And one could make yet another uh, identification of, of you know, McDonald's or whatever. And that kind of larger idea could, could, could be seen through a number of artifacts. But if you're working with the same strategy uh, or the same artifacts over and over again and drawing them into, uh, and not, not casting them out now, but drawing them into a larger urban strategy, if you take the big house in Indiana, the, the Snyderman house in Fort Wayne, and the Hansman house, which are individual pieces on the landscape, uh, they could be seen as kind of uh, quasi-like villas, uh, individual objects set in an open field. But the point is, about both of them, to compose them around a larger construct of the landscape, to draw in and push out in the open landscape where I found those sites, or those sites were given, and make reference to ways that one, in the city at least, which is probably the more important problem, bringing in and collaging the, the everyday, uh, the high art, the whole, the whole range within the city in, in that composition, and in a sense, replaying and seeing fragments brought together in the composition, uh, I think, is absolutely essential. And there are people like uh, uh, Gunnar Asplund, which you've probably never heard of, and, uh, a practicing architect in the 20s and 30s in, in, in Stockholm. Incredible architect in terms of making, not background buildings, but forming a, a strategy about uh, uh, everyday functions like office buildings and the kind of specialized functions of those buildings and making portions of them honorific and portions of them as a part of the whole city strategy. Uh, and as, as, as if the building were seen as infill within the void of the city. And I think that, it, for me at least, if, if one has that, that, uh, that, that the possibility of, of, of transferal figure and ground, of solid and void, and the way we start to read compositions and understand them through the, through the meanings allotted to those compositions, I think it, in fact it is the, is the opposite of, of, of uh, obsolescence, and it keeps the, the thing going, as it were. It's true. Sure, sure. Um, yes, it's also a hedge against white architecture, so. Uh. <laughs> yes? Most of them. The which? Yes. Hardy Holtzman and Five, yeah.
um, interesting stories connected to those buildings. Um, Paul Cannon School was designed by Charles Le Greco, who was a former student of mine, um, and so there are similarities. That's not to say it's like my architecture, it's just that, um, in a sense, we grew up together at Princeton and, and uh, helped to form each other. Um, but in that school building, if any of you know it, um, the idea of the machine 